passage um, in Mark chapter 6, verse 30. So um, I'm talking slowly so you have a chance to pick up your Bible. It would be really helpful. There is another passage that I'll be referring to in the Old Testament a little bit, um, and you may want to flick back to that uh, too. But um, for most of the time, we'll be there in Mark 6. So I've repeated that enough that you've all now found it, and it will be verse 30. Um, just to set, set the back, remind us of the background where we've come from uh, at this point in Mark's gospel. The, the, uh, the disciples have been on a mission. Uh, if, you, if you've got your Bible open, which you now definitely have, you can see in chapter 6 and verse 6 to 13, uh, that section. They've been on a mission and they've returned back to Jesus. And um, well, let's find out what happens when they do in verse 30. Let's read it again. Verse 30, the apostles gathered round Jesus and reported to him all that they'd done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they didn't even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognised them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. Uh, it feels to me uh, when I read verse 30 like they're coming back quite excited. You know, when people come back and they tell you everything they've done in their day, our children do that after school, that there's a sense of excitement. But Jesus knows they're incredibly tired and, and hungry. And so they cross the lake and um, in verse 32. And and then what happens is, is that they get followed. So the people that they've just been with um, see them getting in this boat to go somewhere quiet and they kind of run round the edge of the shore and by the time these tired and hungry disciples start to pull into the, 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 the next shore for their rest and they look ahead of themselves at the beach, there's all these familiar faces there again, staring back and waiting for them. I wonder how you would feel <laughs> if you were in that position. Um, in fact, I wonder how you feel about the people that you bump into anyway, especially when you're tired or hungry. I don't know. I, I, I think um, the way that I viewed people has changed depending on my age a little bit. I, I don't know if that will make any sense to some of you uh, um, who are a little bit older like me. But um, it may be that when we see people and meet people, we, we view them as kind of confidence boosters. So some days I'm not feeling good about myself. But if I bump into the right people who say the right things, I might end my day feeling quite good about myself. And so the people are there uh, to boost my confidence. Or it may be that I just view people slightly as the competition. And so I'm envious of some of them, but I feel better than some of them. And they give me a sort of sense of where I am in the pecking order. Um, but I, I view them with envy. Or, uh, and I think now I'm a grumpy old man, I think this is a bit more my uh, disposition, to, I'm afraid, view people when I'm tired and hungry as annoyances, as uh, people who are slightly in the way. Um, I think, I think that's what the disciples were thinking. My clue to that is in verse 35. We'll come back up in a moment. But if you look down in verse 35, by this time it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away. So they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Send them away. What's their solution to the hunger of the people who followed them around on the beach? Send them away. We need our sleep. We need our food. And it's with that background that we find out how Jesus views people. Verse 34. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. That word, it, it literally means a sort of a gut-wrenching uh, compassion, emotion, because they're like sheep without a shepherd. I think it's tempting to read that and assume that it, it's referring to a bunch of oddballs. Jesus had compassion on them because these poor particular individuals were just so lost and hopeless. But Remember, this is just a crowd of people. They're not a bunch of oddballs. There's 5,000 men, but there's women and children there. 
Some will be on their own, others in families playing together. They're just ordinary people. And Jesus looks at them and he's moved to his core by people who are like sheep without a shepherd. And it, it's, it's meant to make us ask what that means and, and to, to remind ourselves what the Bible means when, it, when we're described so often as, as like sheep. Um, I think sometimes we, you might hear someone say, oh, well, the Bible calls us sheep because we're all stupid. There, there is a little bit of truth in that, but I don't think it's quite enough. And actually the verse helps us to understand what the Bible means by sheep because Jesus' gut is wrenched because they are like sheep without a shepherd. People are made to have a shepherd just like sheep you don't get there's no such thing as a wild sheep is there that they, they, they are their very design is to have a shepherd and the bible says that we're like that we are made for a shepherd for for the shepherd and we don't we don't think that we assume that the project of life is to be independent to be kind of free but the bible says that people are like sheep and and we need a shepherd we're made for a shepherd and that we've walked out on him. I don't want us to all start singing, but the familiar verse from Isaiah 53, we like sheep have gone astray, turned each one to his own way. And, and like sheep, when we do that, we become vulnerable without that shepherd. It puts us in enormous danger. It doesn't mean that, that it always feels like that. The sheep might happily have wandered miles from the shepherd and just be chewing grass, oblivious. But we are in danger without a shepherd, uh, were lost and vulnerable to attack. Um, and it might be that somebody, maybe someone here, but that, that life can feel fine on our own. But then when life hits hard in some kind of way, whether it's death or illness or uh, all that COVID brings or uh, just a, a growing sense of uh, why am I here? What am I doing? of hopelessness and lostness, that somebody starts to realise that they weren't made to be alone, that we were born to be shepherded. Um, and I wonder if even as believers, it, we might have been, been Christians for a long time and we know our Bibles well and we're familiar with the fact that we need a saviour. And we, we're very familiar and certain of that. Of course, we need a saviour. We, we know our sin all too well. We need the forgiveness of a saviour. But Jesus knows that we need a shepherd and not just a saviour. Um, let me give you an example. Supposing you're walking down a country lane and you see a sheep that's in a ditch, is upside down. And uh, you say to the sheep, you say, what are you doing? And the sheep looks up at you and says, well, I was... Uh, I was just walking along and I, I just tripped over and I've ended up like this and I can't get up again. And so you think, well, there's a sheep that needs saving. And so you sort of stretch down and grab its, uh, is it a paw? No, it's not a paw, a foot, leg. You grab its leg and you pull it out and set it up again. And um, But the next day you're wandering down the country lane and the sheep's back in the ditch. And so you reach down again to pull it out and the sheep needs saving. But after a while, you start to realise the sheep doesn't just need a saviour. And he's a shepherd. It can't really navigate life itself at all. It's not just saving, it's shepherding. And if Jesus were to stand in, if you're in contact and Jesus were to stand in the middle of your school and look out on people, many very confident, laughing, joking around, he would be moved to compassion seeing sheep without a shepherd or up on London Bridge, maybe in less covid times but seeing those crowds wandering to and fro trying to get and grab and and rise to the top and jesus would look out and see sheep without a shepherd and be wrenched but he doesn't just weep he's stirred to action and what follows in this second half is the well-known account of the feeding of the five thousand but before we dive into to that sort of second half of our passage i want us to stop and ask how we're meant to read uh, such a passage. What kind of account are we reading? If we don't know that, we can't read it properly. And 
uh, it's with sadness that I've got to tell you, when you read the commentaries on uh, on the passage, people don't um, people often read this in some very sad ways. There are some who read it like as if they're reading a parable. Uh, and so um, they treat it as if it's a story that Jesus told and they're looking for a moral. Um, uh, I'm not saying that is how you should read a parable, but that's what that's what seems to happen. So I'm reading a it's like reading a parable. I'm looking for a moral. Um, so they might say, well, this is a real lesson in sharing, isn't it? Uh, through the generosity of one very insignificant little boy, a great deal of good comes about. And the answer to that is that sharing is great, but there's no boy in sight here, not in Mark's account, and it's not a parable. We need to be careful how we read things. Others will read it like it's a fiction. Some commentaries start with the assumption that what's recorded here isn't possible, and so they look for a natural explanation to add in to help us to understand what really happened. And ideally, it will be an explanation that's added that also has a really good moral to it. So some have said that probably what really happened was this little boy got out his lunch and his generosity shamed the rest of the crowd so much that they admitted that they'd all brought their lunch boxes with them, but were just hoping to keep the food for themselves. And so they all got out their lunch boxes and had food. And so again, it's a parable that it's a, it's a, a fiction. Um, or a half truth that helps us to learn to be generous. But again, there's no boy, there's no, there's no packed lunches in sight. In fact, it's no fiction. It's the only miracle recorded in all four gospels. So for anyone, this has got to be an eyewitness account of the highest certainty. So how do we read what happened? How do we read this true account? Well, We've just read, haven't we, that Jesus has compassion on this large crowd because they're like sheep without a shepherd. And that clue is meant to send us back to our Old Testaments in order to understand what happens now. In fact, to a number of passages, but in particular, the critical one is Ezekiel 34. If you want to have that open, I'm going to read parts of it out. If you want to just listen, uh, that's OK. Um, it's it's a very encouraging passage, um, revealing God's heart. It's a very moving passage. It's also an incredibly long passage. So I'm just going to read some selected parts for you. So hopefully some of you might be there now. It's uh, Ezekiel 34. Let me read verse one. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with wool and slaughter the choice animals. But you do not take care of the flock. You've not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You've not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You've ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth and no one searched or looked for them. The reason why I just stop there for a moment. The reason why this particular Old Testament passage is so important to have in our minds is not just a very close link to shepherds and sheep. It's actually that we've just met one of those false shepherds in chapter five. King Herod in chapter five provides a stark contrast to Jesus in chapter six. Herod, the false shepherd, if you perhaps look later, he threw a banquet and he just invited a select bunch of his VIP friends. Chapter five, verse 21. Jesus, moved by compassion, provided food for anyone and everyone who came. Despite the disciples suggestion, no one would be sent away by him. While Herod was gorging himself on the finest food and drink, he sent orders for one of God's sheep, John the Baptist, to be slaughtered and his head to be brought on a plate in order to please a girl. Jesus provided food for the crowd with no cost. Well, there would be a cost 
to him. He sat them down, gave thanks and broke bread, a symbol that will be fully explained later. He came himself to be slaughtered and broken on a cross in order that his sheep might live. What a contrast with the false shepherds. Let's pick up Ezekiel again in, in chapter 34, because the whole chapter tells us that God will remove false shepherds like Herod, but would come himself to shepherd his sheep. Verse nine, therefore, you shepherds hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for my flock. I'll remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and it will no longer be food for them. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. Further down in verse 28, they will live in safety and no one will make them afraid. I will provide for them a land renowned for its crops. They will no longer be victims of famine in the land or bear the scorn of the nations. Then they will know that I, the, I, the Lord their God, am with them and that they, the Israelites, are my people, declares the sovereign Lord. You are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, declares the sovereign Lord. Let me stop there. Ezekiel 34 does describe God sending a David-like figure to shepherd his people. But it's clear through the whole chapter that this figure will be God himself rolling up his sleeves and coming in compassion as their shepherd himself. And when, with that background, many of the details in Mark 6 seem to fall in place. Many of the details emphasise that this compassionate shepherd, Jesus, is none, none other than the creator God himself rolling up his sleeves and coming down. There's so much emphasis placed on how what Jesus did was a miracle of creation itself. They're out in the desert place. That's given three times in the first paragraph. They're out in the desert place in the wilderness. They're away from food and Tesco's and other shops. There's 5,000 plus mouths to feed. They've got just five loaves and two fish. All eat and are satisfied. And then there's 12 baskets of leftovers. The details are there to tell us that this is a miracle of creation. The God who made something from nothing has come to provide and to create for his people. It was God himself who provided bread for his people in the wilderness. And again, now here in the wilderness, in the desert place, he's come to shepherd his sheep and provide for them. Even the detail in verse 39, I don't know if you spotted, there's a strange detail added, which is meant to take us back to God himself as the shepherd. I'll give you a moment, in fact, just to read, reread verse 39. Because there's a word there that really doesn't need to be there. Has anyone ever seen blue grass or red grass or purple grass? I've only ever really seen green grass. Well, Jesus directed all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. It's the only uh, gospel that mentions the colour of the grass. We ought to ask ourselves, why is it there? It doesn't need mentioning, does it? It should make us think twice. How does that relate to God coming to shepherd his people himself? And perhaps then we're reminded of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And as this man directs them to sit down in groups on the green grass and provide so much that no one could be in want, we see again the Lord is keeping his promise. I'll remove those false shepherds and I myself, in compassion, I myself, says the sovereign Lord, will search for my sheep and look after them. As we come to a conclusion, we've strayed from our shepherd, from our shepherd, the great creator God. And sometimes we haven't even realised we're lost and helpless away from the one that we were always made to follow. And yet God himself, stirred to the depths of his heart of compassion, 
has come to gather us in again and shepherd us once more. And as he broke bread in order to provide all we need, so his body was broken that his sheep might have all they need, that they might not be in want. I wonder if it might just be, as we come to a close, that um, you'd mind if I read Psalm 23. It's familiar words, but now we have that background of the one who would come. Perhaps we can read it in, in, that, in that light, in the light of Jesus. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray as we finish. Father God, we praise you that you did not leave us alone, independent, or in the hands of false shepherds, but that you rolled up your sleeves and moved by compassion, you came to us to save us and to shepherd us in the person of your son. May we stay close and draw close to him every day, the good shepherd. In his name we pray. Amen.